Right, welcome back everybody to another video here on the channel and today we will be starting our second video in our series over the Battle of San Jacinto. Today we will be talking about the Texas perspective and the Texas experience here at San Jacinto. We'll go through several accounts of the soldiers who had fought at this battle, what they would have experienced, and ultimately the mass confusion that resulted. But anyways, go ahead, sit back and enjoy. If you do like this video, please like and subscribe and hit the notification button below. So that way you can get notifications when more history content is uploaded. But otherwise, everybody sit back and enjoy. Currently where I'm standing at is ground zero to where the Texas attack would have unfolded during the afternoon hours of April 21st here at San Jacinto. And I think there's no better place for us to begin our discussion of the experiences of the uh, Texas soldiers than here on the very ground that they had fought. But anyways, before we start talking about individual accounts of the battle, we need to understand the Texas mindset to ultimately see why Texas troops would resort to brutality in the ensuing moments. Well, to understand this, we have to turn the clock back to really March 6, 1836, when the Alamo fell, to where Santa Ana's army had raised the black flag to ultimately declare to the Texas uh, rebels that if they were to surrender, they would be shown no mercy. They would be treated as pirates. And this policy would contain itself throughout much of Santa Ana's Texas campaign, as would be seen not just at the Alamo, but also at Goliad and other isolated instances. And this will outrage Texas troops, especially in Sam Houston's army, who by mid-April were beginning to converge and near the San Jacinto battlefield that we are currently on. And they were growing frustrated with their own commander, not allowing them to get back at those very Mexican troops who had caused those massacres. However, it would be here on April 21st that they would get their revenge. And so now we're going to begin to recount the events that occur after 4 p.m. on April 21st here at San Jacinto. Now on this very ground that I'm standing on right here, ground zero of the Texas attack, many Texas troops were bloodthirsty and they were ready to attack the Mexican soldiers at the earliest possible moment. We saw this on April 20th, if you watch the main video of the series, to where Texas troops under Sidney Sherman wanted to take advantage of what they believed was a Mexican retreat. And many, including uh, Captain Jesse Billingsley, would defy orders from General Sam Houston to attack the Mexican forces. However, a general engagement would not be brought upon on April 20th. But the same feeling, this discontent towards Sam Houston for not allowing them to seek their revenge would carry on to April 21st. And Sam Houston, reluctant to attack on the early morning hours, wanting to the Mexican army to attack him, would save off the attack. And the blood of the Texas troops was beginning to get up, and their patience with Sam Houston was growing thin. And there's many historians who recount that had Sam Houston not ordered an assault on April 21st in those afternoon hours, that the army would have mutinied. He would have easily been overthrown from command, but they would have attacked anyway. But nonetheless, he would finally give in to his troops, and in the afternoon, he would order an attack against Santa Ana's army. And the Texas army, around 4 p.m., guarded by a gentle rise in the land, would begin to emerge from those very trees that we see off in the distance. And ultimately, when they emerge off in the distance, they would be formed into their regiments, trying to fight what Houston was hoping would be a... Uh, classic Napoleonic style battle to where they would have these large drawn battle lines marching shoulder to shoulder and issuing large volleys at the Mexican troops. However in the fields that we see before us they're relatively well open and they are perfect for this Napoleonic style fighting. And this would have favored the Mexican army, something that Sam Houston probably did not consider. And it would only be the actions of the Texans that would stave them off from ultimate disaster. As soon as they come out and are visible from the Mexican army, about 100 yards off in the distance, they would open fire. And this is where the battle begins to become confusing. What we need to understand is that these Texas troops that attacked here on this day, they were in the age of the black powder rifle. As soon as they discharged their weapons, a field of smoke would have emerged all across the battle. Imagine thousands of rifles going off all at once, and they discharge the smoke. Multiple shots, both from the Mexican as well as the Texas camps, would be fired. And quickly the battlefield would be uh, would have a cloud of smoke over it. This is what creates that confusion. And by the time the Texas Army enters the Mexican camp, they could barely see because of this uh, lingering smoke. It's what historians have called the fog of war. 
But anyways, nonetheless, they would press on. And they would not listen to orders from Sam Houston to stop and reload their weapons, this classic style of fighting, but rather they would continue with their momentum, continue to push forth. Even though the Mexican army would put up some resistance, because the Texas troops wanted to get at the Mexican army shouting, remember the Alamo and remember Goliad, it would actually save their, or improve their chances for victory. Because by not giving up the momentum, by continuing to charge, they would get into the midst of the Mexican camps and ensure that the Mexican army could not take its advantage of its professional army. But here, once they get into those Mexican camps, this is where confusion would reign supreme in a massacre and ensue. As Texas troops, as well as Mexican troops, begin to intermingle. This is here where we will begin to read our accounts. The Texas soldiers were fighting in the midst of the Mexican encampment just off the distance over there. So to understand the utter confusion that began to ensue here at the Battle of San Jacinto, just outside the Mexican uh, camp, let's read from those Texas soldiers who had fought here at the battle themselves to see the sights that they would have experienced and ultimately the sounds and the emotions that they would have felt. So as soon as the Texas troops began to emerge and open fire on the Mexican camp, one Lieutenant John Borden would write in years afterwards that in a very short time, perhaps a minute, the firing became general, meaning everybody was firing all at once. Smoke from the cannon and small arms rendered it impossible to see the shape or the size of our enemy, demonstrating that that fog of war was beginning to uh, impact the performance of the Texas troops as well as those who were here on the battlefield. But on we pushed, pell mill, helter-skelter, into the Mexican encampment the Texas troops would ultimately go. However, another uh, Texas soldier who fought here at San Jacinto, Creed Taylor, he would have crowned a different vision of the battle that has gone down in history books, stating that the Mexican army basically threw up their arms and immediately fled. Creed Taylor would write that the Mexicans were not cowards and for a time fought desperately. However, as the onslaught increased and the Texans became more desperate, the foe lost spirit and fell back, finally running towards the center of their encampment, where their brave officers tried to rally them to their colors. This was an account that ultimately Colonel Pedro Delgado, who we'll discuss in another video, would uh, recall as the Mexican junior officers and even senior officers under Santa Ana tried desperately to rally their troops. And even Santa Ana himself would proclaim later on that the fight was not yet lost. However, panic would quickly ensue. As the Texans entered the camp, the Mexican forces would flee down towards Peggy Lake or off to the southwest to where slaughter would be waiting for them. Currently where I'm standing is at the edges of what is the remnants today of Peggy Lake, the marshland and the destruction of water that many of these Mexican troops would have uh, run into after they were trying to retreat desperately out of their encampment on April 21st. And here nearly 600 Mexican troops would be slaughtered as well as various other regions that Mexican soldiers would be slaughtered by the Texas troops. As mentioned before, the reason the slaughter ensues after organized defense has failed for the Mexican army was largely because of that thirst for blood that many Texas troops had following the massacres at the Alamo as well as Goliad. And here I'd like to recount just a few uh, accounts of the uh, Texas soldiers of their feelings as they began to emerge here on the uh, edges of uh, Peggy Lake. This account was one by one William Foster Young who would write that after forcing the Mexican army out of their encampment, we drove them into a marsh, and I sat there on my horse, shot them until my ammunition ran out. Then I turned the butt end of my musket and started knocking them in the head, demonstrating that the Texas troops, even though they had defeated their enemy, they wanted to ensure that they got their revenge for the massacres that had occurred at the Alamo and Golia, demonstrating to the Mexican army that if they would not show any quarter, the Texas troops would likewise not show any quarter. But this would not be the only account of the Texas atrocities that day. As one, Robert Hancock Hunter would write, Boys, you know how to take pri or you know how to take prisoners. Take them with the butt of your guns. And remember the Alamo and remember La Beja. And club guns right and left and knock their brains out. Demonstrating in the heart of the battle and the confusion, still the outrage of these Texas troops here at San Jacinto. Now by no means, as this massacre begins to ensue, do I want to diminish the bravery that would have been fought by the Texas troops in the midst of the battle. 
However, what occurs at the end of San Jacinto demonstrates to us how quickly a battle can de, um, can begin to fall apart and then soon to a massacre. And it's no surprise that General Sam Houston and many other of his uh, commanding officers who were in his army struggled to get their troops under control. Even some officers even continuing to push for much of the slaughter. However, by nightfall, the slaughter would end. And over 700 Mexicans would be taken prisoner. Amongst them, on Santana, who would formally sign over rights to Texas. However, this is only the beginning of Texas's fight, if you will, against Mexico, because even though Texas will rule itself as its own republic for the course of the better part of the next decade, we'll see that there will be constant struggles between them and the Mexican government over authority, whether it was on their border or within their territories. But nonetheless, Texas independence would be gained here through the experiences of those men. And hopefully this video has brought to light just a little bit the experience of those who had fought here. But anyways, if you would like to see the Mexican experience of the battle, stay tuned next time for a video on the Mexican experience here at San Jacinto. But anyways, that's the end of our video here today. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, if you did like the video, please like and subscribe to the channel as well as hit that notification button, button so you can get notifications on all future history content that I will be releasing. But anyways, without further ado, everybody go out, be safe, and I'll see you all next time.